All right, welcome to another episode of Freight FM, a podcast by Interlog USA. Today, I am joined um, by Interlog's Vice President, Justin Inglemeyer. Thanks for joining us today, Justin. Really Thank you. In this episode, um, we're going to be discussing how to be proactive when dealing with emergency events, how to prepare for the unexpected events, and some things that Interlog does to help our customers um, during these events. So I'll kind of start it off. Um, the biggest thing that's um, really been happening the last couple of years um, has been the pandemic. And Justin, kind of like your thoughts on that, um, how Interlog handled that in the beginning when it first started, the peak of it, and kind of where we're transitioning now towards the end of it, so I would say. So I think that there's two uh, main factors at play here. The, the pandemic hit, and the first thing that, that we had to adjust to was none of us were in the office anymore. And so we were used to always being together in our office, and everyone was at our, at our one headquarters location. We didn't have really off-site people or anything like that. Um, and so that was a bit of an adjustment, but I think we learned a lot of things and we, we learned that people can do really well working remotely, um, especially certain, certain areas like sales and marketing. Um, and we actually started hiring a lot of sales reps that were the best individuals and people for our company instead of just finding people that were local to us. And so we were able to go out and expand our company and grow and develop with the sales and marketing team that isn't necessarily local, but just finding the best fit for our company. Um, and that helped us a whole bunch. You know, our operational side though, um, that was more challenging for them to go through uh, remotely. And so a lot of them are back in the office more frequently than the marketing team, which you are a part of, obviously, and, and, and you guys come in a couple times a week, but realistically, the operation side, it's important for them to be around each other and collaborate on ideas. Um, but again, they do the best that they can when, when they have their days of working remotely. And we utilize things like Microsoft Teams, Instant Messenger, so people are collaborating together really well. So that, that was the big thing for, I think, our company and internal. But the second factor was what happened to our overall industry. And when you look at it right away, I mean, people hear supply chain, they see it on the news and they can think, well, is this good? Is this bad for the industry? What's happening? Well, 2020 was not very good for, for the supply chain industry. Um, China was shut down for the better portion of two months. And anyone that's involved with importing and, and moving as a, from a transportation perspective, China's obviously a big deal to us because the U.S. imports roughly 75% of their goods from China. Um, so that being shut down for two months, really, I mean, it, it, it affected everyone in that industry. Um, and then all of a sudden air freight opened up and people were trying to um, import masks and all these other goods. So the, the type of goods that people were buying changed drastically overnight, um, you know, they ran out of Clorox wipes and stuff like that. And so we're trying to get that stuff over here. And people saw the, the price in air freight increase drastically. I mean, overnight, I remember sitting there with customers on the phone at midnight talking to people in China because what you quoted during the day is, was irrelevant to what we were actually booking it for that evening. Um, so while it was a, a unique time, uh, we had to adapt and we had to, we had to start speaking to our customers and telling them what we were really seeing and, and, and that times had changed. Overnight, it changed. We could not tell you, this is what you're gonna book this freight for right now and this is how it's gonna to work tomorrow. Um, and that first started with air freight. Um, then things kind of settled down, but as people stayed home, people started buying other goods. Um, the economy was relatively good and for whatever, however people wanna uh, attribute that to. Um, and so people started having cash and buying more products. Um, and there was a backlog because stuff wasn't coming out of China. So now that goods were being produced again and shelves were relatively empty, um, there, there became a huge strain on the industry where people needed cargo, they needed it last month and they're still sitting here waiting for it. And so there was a tremendous amount of pressure on the capacity that was available out of China, out of uh, you know, Vietnam, all, all over the place. You're talking furniture and you're talking all these other products that 
that people really wanted to buy for, you know, improving their home or creating a new office, whatever it might be. People were spending tons of money on, on new products and there was a huge backlog. And so when you see that pressure, all of a sudden, no one could get capacity. So Interlog used to have two to three very good partners in China that we utilized all the time. And then we brought that up to 14 different partners. So what did we have to do? We had to hire someone. We had to hire a whole new team that really just focused on getting those bookings and developing those relationships. Um, and so, yes, we have always been developing those relationships and that's been important to us, but we never had a booking capacity manager before. And that's something that we had to do. And we had to think proactively, how are we going to get this? How can we get space for people? That's the only way that we can keep our current customers happy. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to bring on new customers. Um, so that was a big part of our business. And we focused on that a lot. And then our sales team, sales and marketing, we had to focus on at that point in time, telling our customers, this is somewhat the range of what we think it's going to be. But again, the price is changing every single day. And so we'll book this for you tonight. We'll communicate with you tomorrow what that looks like, what the price actually is, what we locked in for it. And if it's something completely different than what we told you before, you know, at that point in time, you can say, I'm out. But we had to, we had to start selling a little bit differently. We had to start, uh, again, having our, getting our customers in a different mind frame for them to be able to actually get cargo moved. So um, was the pandemic good for our industry? I'm not going to say it was good. It definitely kept us on our toes and we were constantly, constantly adjusting. And I think that the size of Interlog, you know, we're a small to mid-sized company with 45 employees and we we have the ability to be very nimble and quick. We can make decisions right away. You know, I'm the minority owner of this company and Dave's the president majority owner. I know what I can say and what I can tell our team to do without asking permission. We don't have to go through all these channels. And most of our staff has the ability to make decisions for them, um, for themselves and what's best for the company. And, and we try to push people to do that. And I think that that helped us a lot going through this time where we have to make quick decisions and change things rapidly. Sounds like Interlog, all things considered, handled the pandemic really well. Obviously, it was definitely a tough time for some, but all things considered, sounds like it was all handled pretty well. So that's always good. You know, it, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was interesting at times. You know, I'm not going to say it wasn't, but um, I do. I think we did well as a team. And I think that realistically, the, the team that we have here did a great job throughout it and everyone worked together. And I think a lot of times when you go through these stressful moments, um, that's when you start to learn a lot about the people that you're working with and that you deal with um, and, and who you can rely upon. And fortunately, we had some really good people work through uh, this with us. Now to kind of transition to a similar topic, but the weather, um, we're both located in Minnesota. So we know the winter season does usually start earlier than some got snow what a couple weeks ago so that's always fun but you know with poor um, weather conditions that can cause delays in shipments sometimes um, what are some ways or like best practices for shippers or how interlog handles um, weather type situations um, you know there's there's different there's different routes that can alleviate the snow um, so you can start to get into that. But realistically, um, you know, it, it, it boils down to we're also as the, the, the weather is a transition into winter. It's also a very busy season for um, our industry where people need their their cargo right away so they can get it on shelves for the holidays. Um, the largest shopping season there is. So um, everyone realistically just wants their freight and they want it as soon as possible. This is kind of crunch time for them. And so when it comes down to that, depending upon where the cargo is going, we try to find alternate routes and give them different choices. So, um, you know, some people, it might not be that big of a deal. It might be furniture and, you know, they have a time frame of, well, the customer's not expecting it today. And if it's two weeks later, so be it. Um, but we can't change our rate. We don't want to pay more on it. 
Uh, other people, they absolutely need the product on their shelves right away. Um, otherwise, Targets, Walmarts, the whomever, they're not even going to participate. They're not going to buy those goods if they don't have them right away. So um, those customers, we do different things like transloading out on the West Coast or East Coast and then moving them inland. Um, the sooner that you can get it on a truck, the faster it is. Um, again, though, if you have if you know a blizzard is coming or something like that, trucking through that isn't really going to happen very well. So, you know, it's really dealing with the situation at the hand with the customer and trying to customize what's best for them. And I assume communication really plays a big role into this and making sure that you are talking to your forwarder um, as much as you can when you do see these we um, weather events sort of pop up. Um, any tips on that or thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, Emily, I, I think that that's, um, I think a lot of times people don't truly understand that there are a lot of differences or, or different options out there, um, but there are. So when I think of something like air freight, anytime a customer comes to us about air freight, you know, I, I want to know exactly when is your cargo ready and, and what is the absolute deadline of where you need it to get to point B? What, what is that deadline? And so you have to have an understanding of what they're looking for. Because if we tell them this is three to five day shipping, that doesn't mean anything if today is Thursday and it doesn't depart until next week, Tuesday, because that's not three to five days. So you have to know exactly, again, when is this cargo ready? When does it get there? What's your price range that you're looking for? And then we can give you different options based on that. Um, again, there are certain routes even going inland that, that you know you can go all water from China to Houston, or you can go um, from China to Long Beach, hop on the rail, get to Dallas, you know, and, and there's, and when we're seeing different delays at different ports for different reasons, you know, that's when we have to start speaking with our customers and truly to tell them what the differences are. Um, or there's some expedited services like Matson out there where yes, it is significantly more expensive, but, you can cut down your transit time and it's a lot more reliable. So, you know, when, that's when we're talking to our customers and when, when some customers or some prospects or something say, just give me your lowest rate, what's your lowest rate? I don't necessarily know how to do that without understanding their business and what they need. And so these examples are extreme. When you start talking about, you know, uh, extreme weather as hurricanes, stuff like that, or any of these things, um, you know, or, or ports being built up in certain areas, congestion due to holidays, something like that. That's where you really need to have an understanding of what, what they need and what we're able to offer. And you mentioned hurricanes. Um, hurricane season is, it technically ends in like the beginning of November, though hurricanes can happen anytime. But how can hurricanes really kind of disrupt ports? And when they do cause temporary closures for ports, whether it's like 24 hours or whatnot, how, how do we kind of communicate to our customers um, how to adapt to that and how to navigate that uh, situation? Yeah, you know, and, and each situation is a little bit more, each situation is somewhat unique, but they're similar, I guess. So, you know, if you look at Katrina, you look at Sandy, you look at the current one down in Florida, you know, Florida was hit on the, the west coast of Florida, um, so in the Gulf area, and that's not really where, where most of the best, that, that's not where, where the ports are located, you know, when you talk about Miami, Jacksonville, and Savannah, um, it, it, it was on the other side, and so from our standpoint, what we do within the supply chain industry, um, that didn't affect us too much, but when we talk about Houston and New Jersey, and, and those areas that really get affected by it, um, you know, you, you need to have an understanding of what your customers are looking for. You know, where, where is this final destination here? And, and not only is it, you know, ports being shut down, but labor, I mean, imagine, I mean, all these families, their lives are disrupted. So it's not like, you know, it's just the port got damaged, so we have to fix the port. Um, you know, they, they're, they're strewed all across the country after, um, they get a devastating event like that. So for the most part, unless goods are trying to get into those areas, we, we then do our best to avoid them. Well, um, 
that'll kind of conclude our episode today, Justin. It was great having you on. I appreciate your time and all of your insights with all of this. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Um, all right. And um, make sure you guys stay tuned for more episodes coming for Freight FM.